History of European Theatre podcast and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 85. Bernini and Others. Sculpture, Architecture and Plays. Last time we took a brief visit to the Netherlands, where theatre took its place in the Dutch Golden Age, a flourishing of the arts which, considering all the strife in the neighbouring countries, was something of a minor miracle. The Dutch were less connected to the centre of the Renaissance in Italy and France, although, as I mentioned, there was some fertilisation from Italy and from England. Dutch theatre, with the exception of the morality play Everyman, is not something that you're likely to have come across much, if ever, but I think it was worth the visit. However, now it's time to return to Italy once more, which is fitting as we near the end of the European Renaissance theatre season. Back, that is, to the birthplace of the Renaissance for one last visit in this theatrical age. But our starting point today is not in the theatre, but in the home of sculptor Pietro Bernini in Naples. He was a sculptor of some renown and a Tuscan by birth, but he'd taken up residence in Naples in 1562 to fulfil a commission working on the monastery there known as the Charterhouse of St Martin. As was often the case with large-scale sculptural projects, he remained in Naples for several years, until moving to Rome to complete papal commissions there. So it was in Naples that his son Gian Lorenzo was born in 1598. The son inherited the father's talents and was helping him with crafting stone from an early age. By the time the family moved to Rome, he was already recognised as a talented sculptor and one who would probably surpass his father's talents, which is exactly what he did. He was soon being supported and encouraged by aristocrats and cardinals until, finally, he became the protégé of Pope Pius V. Bernini was to live into his early 80s and work as a sculptor and architect for most of that time. He served under the wing of eight popes in all, and by doing so became one of the most significant contributors to the built landscape of Rome. In sculpture, he studied the classics, but then introduced what would become known as the Baroque style, at which he excelled. As an architect, he designed most of St Peter's Basilica and the Grand Square in which it sits. And if that had been his only significant achievement, then surely we would still remember him. But there was much, much more to Bernini than just that. Bernini had a consuming religious faith and was said to never have missed attending Mass daily. That ardent faith kept him safe and employed, even when he introduced new ideas that others might have struggled to get a hearing for. Not surprisingly, he was happy in Rome, so close to the centre of the Catholicism he strongly adhered to. Through his sculptures, he attempted to inspire the faithful, and as such, he's seen as an artistic leader of the Counter-Reformation that spread out from Italy through the rest of continental Europe towards the end of the 16th century. The only mention of him ever leaving Rome on one occasion was that he travelled to Paris, where King Louis XIV requested his advice on the plans that were being drawn up for buildings that would become the Louvre and the Tuileries. Aged 46, he married a young wife and they went on to have 11 children. Apart from these details, little is known of his life, but he lives through his work. He was very energetic in everything he did and became a very famous person in the city of Rome, so much so that it's said that crowds would often follow him when he went about his business, which was an occupation that risked the bite of his very quick temper, which he was well known for. In business and art, which for him were inextricably linked, I think we would say he didn't suffer fools gladly. So why, you are wondering, am I going on about this sculptor? However famous and important he was in the field, and maybe he wasn't the nicest person to meet anyway. Well, I'm glad you asked. It's a lesser known fact, but something that I suspect will come as no surprise to you, that he had more than one artistic string to his bow, and that he very much liked the theatre. So much so that for several years he worked on scenery and stage effects for travelling players. In sculpture, he was regarded as only second best to Michelangelo. In architecture, he had no serious rivals for most of his career, and pretty much the same is true of his stage designs and effects. He became known for creating shocking, startling effects that many took to be magic. 
Any production that he agreed to design for was guaranteed success, and the purse strings of sponsors would become significantly looser if it was known that requests for finance were to enable Bernini to complete the effect or set according to his vision. Given that these strings sometimes belonged to cardinals and popes, he had some very large budgets to enjoy. So when I mentioned travelling players, these were not the third or fourth rung of the circuit, and probably not even the second rung but those who performed for the court, the aristocrats, for the popes and the cardinals. And yet still there is more to Bernini. He was not just a stage designer and effect specialist, but a man who clearly thought about the impact that theatre as a whole could have. He wanted the audience not just to watch unfolding events on stage, but to experience them for themselves. All the better to really feel the emotions that the characters in the play were experiencing and he went to some extraordinary lengths to make sure that this happened. There are two particularly famous examples involving water and fire. In the first case, the stage suddenly became flooded with water, water that continued to roll towards the audience until those in the front row began to panic and move backwards. But at the last moment, a barrier was raised from the floor, and the flood, or at least most of it, diverted to run off the stage. From another production, he made it appear that members of a torch-lit procession that moved across the stage had accidentally set the stage on fire. Disaster! As the audience began to flee in panic, there was a sudden deluge of rain on the stage and the fire was extinguished. The scene following the fire depicted a beautiful and lush garden, designed to contrast the scene of devastation the audience had just witnessed and luckily escaped. It isn't quite the modern idea of immersive theatre, but it must have been exciting and nerve-wracking for those present. Of course, the one big advantage of the time was that there would have been no health and safety checklist to review or certificate of fire safety to obtain. In 1637, he produced designs for a comedy that had two casts who performed for two audiences in separate theatres. Sadly, the details of how this worked are lost, other than for a comment that there was much interweaving of the plots, which held many complications. Now, as far as I can tell, performing two related plays in two theatres was not attempted again until Alan Akebourne's House and Garden at the Stephen Joseph Theatre in Scarborough in 1999, and then again at the National Theatre in London in the year 2000. I think the inspiration for that came from the fact that both of these complexes have two theatres that share a foyer space and mutually accessible backstage areas. And perhaps both Benini and Akebourne, as practical men of the theatre, were thinking that it might just double the attendance numbers for the run. At about the same time that he was working on these plays, Bernini also worked on two operas, which were seen by the English student and diarist John Evelyn. He was a traveller, and between his accounts of anatomy lessons at Padua, he mentioned the good impressions that Bernini's opera designs left on him. But there is yet another string to Bernini's bow. Bernini wrote at least 20 plays, only one of which has survived. His son recorded snippets about the details of some of the lost plays, but it's not enough to make an assessment of how good a dramatist Bernini really was, or exactly how many plays he wrote. It's not a given that theatre practitioners of excellence make good dramatists, but it's certainly a good start. And Bernini was good at everything he did, so chances are that we've missed out on some greatness here. The problem is that even the surviving play is very short and slight, but more of that in a moment. We know that Bernini began to write plays during a period of illness, when he was 36 or so, and unable to get out and about for his usual work creating designs, sculpting marble, and cajoling the teams of craftsmen and labourers that he had working for him. For such an active and enthusiastic person, this period of enforced lethargy must have been a struggle. One possible reason for why the plays did not survive was that they were, according to Bernini's son, of an obscene and scatological nature. Now that does seem an odd choice for a man who was extremely pious, but we have no reason to doubt his son's assessments. It seems that they were probably pieces closer to the carnival skit rather than something to be seen in the theatre or at the literary salon. Again, as reported by his son, Benini would not allow them for public performance, presumably because of their coarse nature, and they were played at his private residence for his friends and other guests. His home, a quite substantial building in Rome, had a small theatre in it, where Bernini himself directed the plays and prepared every aspect of the production, including the financing, which came from his own pocket. 
the cast was often drawn from his own extended family. Perhaps the most significant way in which they differ from his previous theatrical work is that they were simply produced with minimal scenery effects and set design. We can perhaps read into that that he was becoming disillusioned with plays that relied on big effects and he was looking for something to get back to the truer form of theatre through simplicity and communication with the audience that didn't rely on shock and surprise. In a further twist to the story, the one surviving play by Bernini is a play about putting on a play. It, like the others, was thought lost until it was rediscovered in 1963 by a researcher working through the Benini papers held in the French National Archives in Paris. Folded into the papers relating to a plan to repair the Trevi Fountain in Rome, an ambitious plan which involved removing large parts of the fountain, was the script for an untitled play. Thought to have been written between 1642 and 1644, it was first published in 1964 under the title The Trevi Fountain, referring to the papers in which it was found, and not to any content of the play. The first English translation was published in 1985 as The Impresario. Opinions on the play are divided, and perhaps opinions of all sorts are coloured by the expectation that someone as brilliant and energetic as Bernini must have produced something exceptional. The first problem is that the script is at best incomplete, maybe even just a fragment, and at worst a preliminary sketch yet to be worked up to a full piece. The apparent gaps in the sparse text give everyone who has looked at it the chance to fill it with ideas of what might have been intended. The editors of the English translation suggest that it is full of references and ideas that would be easily missed by the casual reader. The 13 pages of notes are longer than the printed play itself. Their enthusiasm for the significance of the piece is unbounded, but as others suggest, it is quite possible that they are reading too much into what was only ever intended to be a slight entertainment. Others suggest that the play shares the same territory as Spaniard Calderon's Life is a Dream, as something close to a psychological fantasy. What most agree on is that the piece, little more than a sketch, is Bernini thinking on illusion and reality in the theatre, and that being done with a definite slant towards the art of the scenic designer. Bernini appears to be discussing the dilemmas of that role, where an individual is charged with creating both reality and astonishment in the same moment. The subject of the play is the production of a play, and the characters are the playing troupe who perform it. They are portrayed as a gang out to trick each other and their audience. The action goes like this. Cynthio is a penniless courtier, but of good family. He is in love with Angelica, the daughter of Graziano, who is a set designer, famed for his success at producing spectacular theatrical effects. Cynthio's problem is that there is no way that Graziano, who is well aware of his own importance, will give his daughter's hand to a man with no money. Cynthio is determined to resolve this situation and he turns to his servant Coviello who, true to the expected form, is a boasting trickster. He quickly thinks up a plan to raise a substantial amount of money which will enable Cynthio and Angelica to marry and for Cynthio to pay off his loans to some Jews who are chasing him for payment. He approaches Alidoro, a frustrated rival of Graziano, who agrees to give Cynthio the money in exchange for Graziano's secrets in creating the effects that have made him rich and famous. Cynthio sets around trailing Graziano, but soon discovers that his attentions are currently elsewhere with other projects and he has no intention of engaging in stagecraft at the moment, so there's not much chance of stealing his methods. However, as Corviello suggests, Cynthio can use his well-known friendship with the prince to fool Graziano into revealing his secrets. The plan is hatched and Cynthio approaches the prince tells him that the great Graziano is keen to write and produce a play as a tribute to him. The prince is understandably enthusiastic to encourage what he is led to believe will be a very complimentary piece. Happy to play her part, Angelica then tells her father that the prince has commanded him to provide a comedy for the court immediately. Reluctant to put aside his other projects, but flattered by the extravagant praise that is reported to him, Graziano impulsively takes steps to create a work for the royal order. Angelica, meanwhile, feigns illness so as not to be forced to marry anyone else until Cynthio has the necessary funds and can approach her father again. 
Graziano recalls his usual technical team, a stage carpenter and several other craftsmen, and they set about following his instructions to create a cloud effect, an effect that he has envisioned even before the subject of the play has been decided on. When asked just what sort of cloud the master has in mind, Graziano replies, I want it to appear completely new, natural, and by natural I don't mean a cloud stuck in a place up there. I want my cloud standing out, detached against the blue and visible in all its dimensions, like a real cloud in the air. His assistants believe that to recreate such a reality is impossible, and when the cloud is painted on a canvas and hung in the flies, it collapses and falls to the stage floor where it lies in an unhappy heap. Cynthio has been watching closely, but this failure puts an obstacle in his path. This, he is quick to see, is hardly information worth stealing. It may have been Bernini's intention that in the end Graziano would be able to create his effect, but the script cuts off before the ending is revealed. Now just before that point, Graziano decides that the subject of the play will be the story of an artist who has to write a play and quickly prepare impressive effects for it. So we begin to get a play within a play effect, as the imagined Graziano attempts the same activities that the playwright designer Graziano is also engaged in. Obviously, there's a lot of autobiography here, but it's neither fulsome praise nor supercritical, but a strange mixture of the two. It's as if Bernini was conflicted about his theatrical work, keen to engage and create illusion on the one hand, but feeling that this could distract from the art on the other. It all adds to the feeling that Bernini's intention with this play was to unsettle us and prompt questioning about what we should truly appreciate in art. Plays, not to mention sculptures, can be flashy and entertaining and appeal at an emotional level, but, he seems to argue, must have a core of truth and simplicity for that to have any purpose. Now that might be reading too much into his intentions. He may just have been attempting to explore his own conflictions about the art that he'd produced and the amount of toging he has to do to finance it. Just the sort of questions that artists have struggled with for centuries. As we have recently been up to our necks in Commedia dell'arte, it's worth a mention here that in the play the two servant characters are called Rosetta and Zani, which would immediately have signalled them as from Commedia dell'arte, but as the characters, they don't fulfil the expected roles within that genre. Similarly, Cynthia and Angelica, who are the young lovers, would have been the centre of the action in most Commedia dell'arte, but here they're reduced to little more than a plot device, and it's Graziano, equivalent to one of the older characters, who is centre stage. He should be the dupe of the plot, but against that character type he never loses his dignity and, if the play had been completed, may well have ended up being triumphant. Many unsettling moments for the audience if they arrived with expectations for the comedy. But I wonder if they just ended up confused or perhaps already aware that Bernini was likely to give them something unexpected. It's by no means sure that the impresario was ever performed. In fact, it seems quite likely that it was not. But it is important as a piece that pushed the boundaries of its time in its imagination and ambition. Bernini left many more solid works for us to judge his genius by, quite literally, in his statues and buildings. But this little play is an interesting insight into his imagination. Set designers and scenic artists really had a ball during the Renaissance, and although many of the best were Italian, they often found opportunities abroad to be able to practice their art to the extreme. Particularly, the imperial court in Vienna called on the best of the best and indulged them. Many worked in the realm of opera in Vienna, which by the mid-1600s had become the fashionable form of scenic theatre. But plays were still frequently performed, and the settings were often very lavish – incorporated the new Baroque styling or Italian perspective construction and painting or sometimes a bit of all of these. Little or no expense was spared and ostentation was the watchword in Vienna. Giovanni Bernassini moved from working in Venice and Mantua to Vienna in 1652, where he designed for the opera house under the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand III. It was his equally talented son Ludovici who was commissioned to build a new opera house and also produced the settings for the first production there in 1668. His designs included a massed cloud effect that ran off into the far distance. 
Where the clouds parted, a fleet of massed ships could be seen jostling on the sea, in competition with sea monsters, sea nymphs and the god Jupiter. The actor playing Paris descended from the clouds and held out a golden apple to the Empress Margaret Theresa, who was in attendance with her husband, Emperor Leopold I, for the official opening. As had happened before with some forms of drama, opera under the Habsburgs had become a vehicle for spectacle and not the reverse. This spectacle was in part achieved by the use of not just one vanishing point, but several. Typically, there were two, one on either side of the stage, but in some cases there were multiple points, creating effect that we can only imagine must have caused much distraction, if not a lurch of the stomach. If the focal point was on a particular object, and this was painted to appear thrust forward, the surrounding area could be made to look as if it was receding, and make the stage appear wider and deeper than it really was. Another trick was to paint the forward wings as just the lower portion of a building, enhancing the sense of proximity to the audience and the distance between the forestage and the scenic paintings at the rear. From the late 1600s all the way through to the end of the 18th century, the Galibabinus family provided stage designs for all types of theatre and public events. Ferdinando and his brother worked with their sons and then their grandsons, at first in Bologna and then in Parma and then all over Europe. Ferdinando was particularly innovative, being a significant popularizer of transparent scenery, which was used in special effects and the aforementioned perspective scenery. He was commissioned to produce the festival decorations for the wedding of Emperor Charles VI, and was eventually appointed court architect as successor to Bernassini, from where he designed court theatres and wrote a book on architecture that became a standard text. Both the theatre buildings and set designs within them were at the top end of the art becoming more and more ornate with extensive plaster work decorating the ceilings, statuary inside and out, and paintings, murals and frescoes decorating the walls. Theatres had not been so grand and ornate since late Roman times. For the family of architects and designers, there was plenty of work. Brother Francesco built theatres in Vienna, Verona and Nancy, and son Alessandro gained a position with the court theatre in Mannheim, where he was stage designer in residence. His brother, Giuseppe, worked with his father and then in Prague before building the Opera House in Bayreuth, a theatre that is particularly admired for the balance of its acoustics. Indeed, it's a trait of the whole family that they were as concerned for the sound of a theatre as they were for sight lines and decoration. There were other Italian families that produced generations of theatre architects and designers, but none were quite as prolific as the Galli Bibinas and their activities stretch much further into the Baroque period, but I've already strayed a little further than I should in that direction. So I'll save mention of them for another time. Perhaps it's enough to comment for now that by the end of the 18th century, many of the playhouses from the early Renaissance had been torn down and replaced by Baroque theatres, built in opulent styles and offering lavish shows where, when they had the right sponsor, little or no expense was spared. I think Benini is an example of one of those Renaissance men who had become known for one particular aspect of their work, but in fact were so much more. Had Benini documented and published his ideas on theatre, and it's not impossible that he did write some of them down, but like his plays they've been lost, we might now be thinking of him as a theatre practitioner of his time. That would never eclipse his work as a sculptor or architect, but his input to theatrical life and development would, I think, be more recognised than it is. But this is how the wheel of history turns, and the chance survival of a single manuscript can give us an insight that would otherwise have been completely lost. As we move forward, there is more opportunity to get to know the personalities of those who built, decorated and worked in theatres, and there are more records written about or by them than we have seen so far. But we're not quite there yet. But the Galli Bibinas and Bernini are a start of a trend. Next time, I'm going to do my very best at summing up on the European Renaissance theatre. In some ways, it seems like we've come an awful long way, but in others, not so far at all. So this could be an interesting challenge for me, and I hope it will give you at least some concluding clarity. In the meantime, as I mentioned last time, we are getting towards the end of the season on the Renaissance, so if you have any questions about the period that have been niggling away at you, there's still enough time to send them over to me and I'll do my best to answer them in the concluding episode. 
The Facebook page continues to grow, so please do join us there if you do Facebook. And if not, you can find the podcast on Twitter. And of course, there's even more additional information on the website where you can find all the episodes, blog posts and other related things. I've just made some additions to the website, so all my reading sources for this season have now been added to the list on the site, and I've put a few more things on the list of other theatre-related books that you might be interested in. That's all at www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com. If you'd like some more audio content relating to the podcast and other things related to the history of theatre, please take a look at the offering on Patreon, where you can access all of the content for a small monthly fee. I've put the links to the website, to Patreon and to Ko-fi.com for one-off donations in the show notes. You've probably noticed that I'm a bit croaky while I've been recording today. Unfortunately, I'm just getting over a cold and I did need to get this recorded to get it out on time. I hope this hasn't spoiled your enjoyment of the episode too much. Thanks again for listening and your support in whatever form. I look forward to your company next time when hopefully my voice will be fully recovered. But if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp.